And welcome to The World This Week with Helena Wadia, a look at some of the biggest global news stories for an international city, brought to you by the London Live News team. Today, as the people of Bucha come to terms with the atrocities of war, we'll look at the West's response to claims of genocide by Russian forces. Tributes to a British lawyer and his son killed in a landslide in the Australian Blue Mountains. And the delayed tribute to Raphael reaches the capital, as the National Gallery welcomes the UK's first retrospective of the Grand Italian Master. That's all on the way before 7.30, but first this morning. Thousands of people are continuing their efforts to escape the Donbass region of Ukraine in the southeast of the country, ahead of an expected offensive by Russian forces. Kyiv urged citizens in the area to take the opportunity to flee earlier this week. It comes as intelligence reports suggest Moscow is regrouping troops for an attack on Donetsk and Luhansk. On Friday, dozens of people were killed after a rocket strike on a train station in the region. The UK Ministry of Defence says Russian troops have now all but left northern Ukraine. Their withdrawal has uncovered suspected war crimes, including the torture and massacre of civilians in the Kyiv suburb of Bucha. Hundreds of people there are reported to have been killed by Russian soldiers. Footage, which is too disturbing for us to broadcast at this time, shows bodies lying in the street. Moscow claims the corpses were staged and placed there by Ukraine. 35 days we were in the basement. We were in the basement for 35 days. There was shelling all the time. Sometimes there was no water and sometimes there was no food. There was no light all the time and there was no information and the phones did not work. There were shots all the time. The children were cold and I hugged them all the time. We slept like one body and warmed each other. I told them that everything would be fine and the Ukrainian soldiers would come. I think we are all extremely, I was thinking about that, I think the whole society is extremely traumatized by those images and the level of uh, trauma is just huge and uh, I was getting messages from many journalists abroad saying like, oh my gosh, you know, we are crying while seeing those images and I was thinking, I was not crying, I, I can't cry, I think this this level of shock is just so big that like you just, you can't even cry, you just, uh, yeah, I don't know, some defense mechanisms are working in weird ways. Um, no, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist to understand that. But um, I think we are all extremely shocked. This is just terrifying. But then somewhere among those pictures, I did see a picture of a dead woman. Uh, and she was wearing sneakers, which are similar to the ones I have, like New Balance sneakers. And it's for some reason, it stuck with me. I can't find this image again. But but uh, and, and I can't look at those pictures anymore. Uh, but But I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, she's just like me. We had similar tastes. We probably were shopping in the same shops, going to the same, you know, we were driving on the same road uh, because that is the road I take to visit my parents. And, and uh, seeing that and understanding that um, those deaths were completely random. They did nothing to deserve this. They were just yeah, completely random in a way that uh, it could have been me. It could have been any of my friends, uh, um, anyone. Like there was no reason why those people were killed and not anyone else. The Ukrainian military also shared drone footage this week, which appears to show trenches and tank tracks from the Red Forest, one of the most radioactive locations on Earth and within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. It is just 500 metres from the nuclear complex. Well, let's take a look at some of the news lines to come from the conflict this week. Russian forces attacked a fuel depot and a factory in the southeast of the country as Moscow faced fresh calls to answer for the alleged war crimes in Bucha. The prime minister says what happened in the city close to the capital, Kyiv, appears to amount to genocide. But I'm afraid when you look at what's happening in, uh, in Bucha, the, 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 the revelations that we're seeing from uh, what Putin has done in, in Ukraine, which, you know, doesn't look far short of genocide uh, to me. It is no wonder that people are responding in the way that they are. Dear people of Ireland, this night our territory was again hit by, by Russian missiles. It was done cunningly and it hit civilian infrastructure. 
For them, hunger is also a weapon. The Ukrainian president made more international addresses this week to the UN Security Council and to the people of Ireland. Elsewhere, the Pope kissed a Ukrainian flag that had been brought to him from the city of Bucha. Let's just take a look at the conflict in figures. Russia continues to massively outnumber Ukrainian forces, despite the strong resistance they have faced. Six weeks into the illegal invasion, more than 4.2 million people have been displaced, according to the International Organization for Migration. An international disaster relief charity helping Ukrainians in Eastern Europe said it is prepared to scale up its operations if the influx of refugees continues. Shelterbox has spent weeks helping in Ukraine, Poland and Moldova since the start of the Russian invasion. The charity said it expects the number of people reaching the Ukrainian borders to increase as the war continues. I talked to a woman yesterday who fled with her four small children. Um, and really just a very emotional conversation um, having to kind of pack a few clothes. That's all they were able to bring with them. Um, you know, it's incredibly stressful leaving family behind, um, not knowing what's next, not knowing, you know, once you get over the border, where you go, what you do. Um, a lot of the things that we've heard are, are, you know, people have had to leave their jobs, so they no longer have a steady income coming in. But then there's a question of, you know, how long are you staying here? Can you get a local job here? By and large, everybody wants to be able to go home. You know, most people aren't looking to settle long term somewhere else. Everyone we've spoken to just wants to go home. And so it's kind of all up in the air. Um, there's, there's some questions of, you know, kind of what happens. We're just prepared to do whatever is needed as things change. Um, we know from experience things can change very rapidly. Um, and I think right now it, it's hard to predict where things will go. Um, we are prepared if things escalate to be there to help those people when they need it. Um, and, and really just keeping our options open. The UK government's response came under question again this week amid concerns at the pace at which people were being allowed to enter the country. The refugee minister, Lord Richard Harrington, admitted it was an embarrassment that the Homes for Ukraine process was taking so long. Around 12,000 people had arrived in the UK under Ukraine visa schemes as of Tuesday, according to Home Office figures. Several fleets of NHS ambulances have this week begun the journey from the UK to Ukraine to help provide urgent care for those injured by Russian attacks. London Ambulance Service donated decommissioned vehicles, whilst the South Central Ambulance Service has sent 20 vans to the region. So we're working with the government and UK aid and the NHS ambulance services nationally are all part of this scheme and what we do is we check the vehicles prior to leaving the ambulance service to check they're serviceable and their safety checks are in place so they're, they're service and fit for use. We clean the backs of the vehicles to make sure they're free from infection and to make sure the kit and equipment that we're also donating such as suction units is serviceable and has a full service history ready to be used on the front line. And just one other line on the conflict for now. The UK is to step up the supply of arms after Kyiv pleaded for greater firepower to fight back against the Russian invasion. Boris Johnson said the UK was looking at what more it could give as the NATO alliance met to discuss the crisis. More to come on Ukraine later in the programme, but let's move on to some other news from around the world this week. And to Australia first, where the Premier of New South Wales has paid tribute to a British man and his nine-year-old son who were killed during a landslide in the Blue Mountains. 49-year-old Merab Nazir, a lawyer who had relocated from London to Singapore more than 10 years ago, was hit by falling rocks whilst out on a popular walking track. His wife Anna and their 14-year-old son were seriously injured, while their teenage daughter escaped with minor injuries. Firstly, can I just say my heart goes out to uh, all the families um, of, that, of that tragedy. Um, you know, and, and these tragedies occur too often. Um, so anything that we can do to keep people safe, um, we will. Obviously, Blue Mountains is a, is a place where people love to go trekking. It's, it's one of the wonders of the world. Um, but 
when those tragedies occur, it would be remiss of any government not to act. Six people were killed and dozens more injured during a shooting in the Californian state capital, Sacramento. It happened last Sunday. Police now believe that five were involved with more than 100 shots fired. Three arrests have been made, including two brothers. Those killed were aged between 21 and 57. Our investigators are working tirelessly uh, to determine exactly what occurred and how many people are involved. But we've received over 170 um, files, uh, video and photo, as well as written tips related to the investigation. Um, of those, numerous of them were generated on social media, and all of those are in the possession of our investigators who are working to authenticate, vet, and uh, determine what evidentiary value they have um, to assist in trying to solve this investigation. Israeli security forces killed a Palestinian who opened fire at a bar in Tel Aviv on Thursday, killing two people and wounding 12 others. The man was tracked down by the police and died in a shootout. It's the latest in a spate of attacks in Israel which have killed 13 people. America's Supreme Court will include a black female judge for the first time in its history. The Senate confirmed Justice Katanji Brown Jackson would become the ninth member of the bench. The court oversees laws which govern the U.S. The appointment fulfills President Biden's pledge to put a black woman on the court. And the Chinese city of Shanghai is converting another exhibition centre into a makeshift hospital to take in COVID-19 patients amid surging cases. The National Exhibition and Convention Centre will become the city's largest temporary medical facility with 40,000 beds. Local authorities said close to 20,000 new cases were recorded midweek, most of which were asymptomatic. Shanghai is currently facing a strict lockdown to try and control the virus, but some residents have reported they are running out of food, having been banned from leaving even for essential reasons. The world this week continues after the break. How virtual reality is being used to help those with extreme anxiety. We'll have details of a new groundbreaking therapy developed here in the UK. Welcome back. You're watching The World This Week from the London Live News team, still to come before 7.30. Having escaped the bombing in Ukraine, we'll meet the aspiring ballerina being given a chance to realise her dreams with the help of a former Italian ballet star. Before that, this week saw the UK government set out its long-awaited energy strategy as the Russian invasion of Ukraine continued to see gas prices rise. The PM said as many as eight nuclear reactors could be approved on existing sites to deliver what he claimed would be more independence. Uh, but this is about tackling some of the, uh, the mistakes of, of the past and making sure that we are, are set well for the future. Uh, we're no longer subject to, uh, we'll never again, subject to the, the vagaries of the uh, global uh, oil or gas price. We can't be subject to blackmail, uh, as it were, from uh, people such as Vladimir Putin. We have energy security here in the UK. So it's a massive strategy for uh, delivering uh, 50 gigawatts, that's almost half the total electricity capacity of this country, from offshore wind uh, by 2030, uh, totally reviving the nuclear industry, which I'm afraid has been more or less moribund in this country. This is the home of nuclear energy. We first split the atom in the UK. We had the first civilian nuclear power plant. We're bringing nuclear home with uh, one nuclear plant and one nuclear reactor every year for eight years rather than one uh, a decade. Well, that was Boris Johnson there, but Labour said it was too little too late to help with rising costs, whilst experts said addressing issues around insulation and efficiency would be a better way to bring down bills. Some other stories from this week and in America, a founding member of the US rap group Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five was this week convicted of killing a homeless man on the street in New York. The Kid Creole, whose real name is Nathaniel Glover, was accused of attacking John Jolly with a steak knife in 2017 after thinking he was hitting on him. Lawyers for Glover had argued he acted in self-defense. He had been facing a murder charge, but the jury convicted him of manslaughter. He'll be sentenced next month.
UK Border Force officials and the National Crime Agency revealed the details this week of what they called a monumental seizure of cocaine. The drug, with a street value of more than £300 million, was discovered in pallets of bananas at Southampton docks last month. The Home Secretary said it was the biggest seizure of the Class A substance in the UK since 2015. It had come inside a container on a boat from Colombia in South America. And at least three people have died after violent storms in the southern eastern U.S. state of Georgia. A tornado killed one woman and injured several more on Tuesday evening before more bad weather brought the rescue and cleanup operation to a halt on Wednesday. Several buildings were also destroyed. Well, I just seen both houses was crushed and stuff. So what I did, I couldn't. I, my, she told me go and try to help my son. So I went over there as fast as I could. Like I said, I had to hit on the wall. Just so I can, you know, find out where yet. And then I had to climb boards and stepping on nails and all that stuff because that was my son and I was trying to help everybody out. Well, delayed by the pandemic, the works of Raphael will go on show in London today, said to be the UK's biggest retrospective of the Italian master. More than 90 of his works have arrived at the National Gallery, an exhibition first planned for 2020 to mark the 500th anniversary of his death at the age of 37. So alongside uh, an exhibition mounted in Rome in 2020 during the pandemic, unfortunately, this is the most ambitious exhibition ever mounted on Raphael. It's the f these two exhibitions were the first to try to encompass all of Raphael's career, not just aspects of it, but all of it, and the variety of activities that he was involved with, not just painting and drawing, but his work as an architect, as an archaeologist, an art theorist, and as a designer for tapestry, for print, for applied arts, and for sculpture. Our colleagues across Europe and, and North America for, who provided loans were all incredibly understanding. I mean, there's been a lot of solidarity, I would say, within the, uh, the museum community uh, over the pandemic, and we've all tried to ensure that loans could still happen, exhibitions could still happen, even though we had quite dr drastic rescheduling. So I had a lot of anticipations uh, for this exhibition because um, an exhibition of Ravel's uh, paintings and drawings is always quite an extraordinary event in the art world. Um, his paintings and drawings are so fragile that they seldom travel. And uh, today you can see some artworks coming from uh, the Vatican, from the Louvre, from the Uffizi, from the Museum del Prado. So, it's quite unique and to be able to, to see them all in one space is quite incredible. He was a very um, charismatic and charming person, uh, but he was also very um, uh, interested in preserving his self-image. In a way, he was the sort of influencer of his time. And a portrait like this, well, it's so modern, uh, we look so beautiful, um, um, the look in his eye, it's very staged. And you can see that he had a lot of control over his appearance. And for me, that's very, very relevant for a lot of young people today and all of us, really. Our, our impulse as human beings is to, to do things together. And only by building community and ultimately civilization can we survive and thrive. That, I think, is the basic that the basic message of Rafa, and at a time when a lot of that is not happening around us, you know, at a time of like pandemic and war and climate change, but Raphael offers us uh, an idea about who we might be and where we might be able to get. Raphael is on at the National Gallery until July 31st. Finally, from Italian masters to former ballet stars, a moment of hope has come from the Ukrainian conflict this week after a 12-year-old schoolgirl who managed to escape the Russian invasion was given a chance to realise her dream of becoming a ballerina after being given safe haven by a former star of Rome's Opera House. 12-year-old Elisa fled bombing around Kyiv with her mother and they were taken in by retired ballet star Claudia Zakari. Ballet for me is everything. It's part of my soul, part of my life, and is now part of my family. I can't live without it, and I'm here now because of ballet. I want to continue, improve, and study ballet in the future. 
At first we were sitting at home, not suspecting anything and thinking that the war would end very soon. But after a week we realised that it would continue. First we went to a village near Kyiv and after a week we went to the west of Ukraine. I realised that I needed to study and that I, if I hadn't left, I wouldn't have been able to do so. So we came to Italy, to Claude's house. I'm grateful for her, for her support, for the opportunity she has given me and my family to continue to develop my talent and continue to study. The budding young ballerina had caught the attention of Zakari at previous contests, so when the war began she offered her a home and says she has now been invited to audition for a ballet school in Milan. Well, that's all from the world this week with Helena Warrior. We'll see you at 7 next Saturday as we round up the biggest international stories for a global city. We'll leave you this morning of images from Chester Zoo, who this week shared the moment an endangered miniature baby kangaroo emerged from its mother's pouch for the first time. Named Joey, he has been hidden away for the last six months. Have a great day.